If you have ever been even mildly interested in PC gaming for the past two decades, chances are you already know about the main three players in the graphics space, NVIDIA, ATI, later AMD, and Intel, though with Intel it's largely through their notoriously underperforming integrated graphics through the years. But if you went back just another decade to the mid-90s, the ecosystem looked far different, far less consolidated. And the big name companies that we know today, back then, they played in the yards of a completely different set of giants. Except for ATI. ATI's sort of been there practically from the beginning, as far as 3D graphics go. Point is, for a time leading up to the 2000s, there was another color team beyond red, green, and blue in the running. And no, I'm not talking about 3D FX's splash of orange. I'm talking lemon yellow S3 graphics. Not that they were particularly associated with the color yellow until they were already halfway into the grave, but more on that in a bit. S3 Graphics was founded in January of 1989 by Diosdado, aka Dado, Banatao, alongside his colleague Ronald Yara. Banatao himself is an immensely interesting person to discuss, and I will link an article in my sources if you'd like some further reading on his life. Prior to S3 Graphics, Benatow had started two other businesses and even states that the name S3 comes from the fact that the company was his third startup. He had founded Mostron, a manufacturer of motherboards, as well as Chips and Technologies, a, as its name implies, chipset manufacturer. Though it would later be acquired by Intel, it too would go on to develop graphics chipsets, interestingly enough. Moving on to S3 itself, the company rapidly carved out a niche in paving the way for so-called GUI accelerator cards. Compared to its non-accelerated predecessors and counterparts, these cards were able to perform in hardware basic 2D rendering functions that graphical programs, and especially GUI-driven operating systems such as Windows, increasingly relied upon. And so, for a time, S3 was the de facto king of PC graphics, having gained a large foothold in the high-end 2D accelerator market thanks to the early inroads they had made in the graphics accelerator space. However, this would not last for long. Around the same time that S3's high-end Trio 64 chips had virtually wiped the high-end market, rumblings of the new age of graphics accelerators began to surface. S3 obviously wasn't going to be caught sitting down, and by 1995 already had its own answer to the growing appetite for 3D accelerators, the S3 Verge. Though immensely successful for its low cost and prevalence in OEM systems, thanks in large part to being effectively a 3D capable Trio 64 variant, the Verge was notoriously slow in its 3D performance. Though far from the only failure in the early days of 3D accelerator cards, S3 would, for whatever reason, continue to utilize the rapidly aging Verge core all the way into the late 90s and early 2000s, with one particular variant, the Trio 3D, even outlasting the Verge's own successor, the S3 Savage. It was at this time, as well, that Benatow would leave the company, selling his shares of S3 with plans to become a venture capitalist. This route of constantly refreshing an architecture that was never all that good to begin with stood in stark contrast to the rapid pace of technological advancements made by other companies during this same five-year period from 1995 to 2000, where companies such as NVIDIA had made the leap from the largely ignored NV1 and its strange quadratic polygon rendering to the first ever GeForce. S3, like many other contemporary 3D graphics hopefuls of this time, quickly fell by the wayside. Not that this was necessarily due to a lack of trying, of course. As mentioned before, S3's Savage, or Savage 3D as it was officially dubbed, was the true successor to The Verge. Being pushed with the slogan, Voodoo 2 Performance, at S3 prices, the Savage was exactly that. When it worked properly, that is. Much like the rest of its offerings leading up to the company's demise, the S3 Savage was plagued by driver issues, though when it did work, it was still able to sit comfortably in a mid to high end position. Additionally, S3's introduction of S3TC, a texture compression algorithm that would go on to become fully integrated into both DirectX and OpenGL, provided a steady boost in public perception for its image quality. 
This positive perception of S3's offerings, however, would not last for very much longer. Though the original Savage was able to hold its own, its successor, the Savage 4, often slips far behind 3DFX's Voodoo 3 and Nvidia's TNT 2 in performance, though capable of barely trading blows with Nvidia and 3DFX when overclocked, the Savage 4, much like the Verge before it, held much of its appeal in its low cost. As for S3 itself, its slow death spiral only continued onward. With the lukewarm at best reception to the Savage 4 and its variants, S3 responded by taking a page out of 3DFX's playbook, acquiring one of their board partners. In particular, S3 would acquire Diamond Multimedia in 1999, Finalizing the deal next year, in 2000, with plans to diversify beyond graphics cards. At the same time, the newly merged company announced the S3 Savage 2000. This card, marketed as a direct competitor to Nvidia's own GeForce 256, would feature S3's own transform and lighting, aka TNL, engine, to counter the selling point behind Nvidia calling the GeForce the first GPU. Unfortunately, this effort for a competitive push would once again be hampered by S3's age-old nemesis, Garbage Tier Drivers. Though their TNL engine, dubbed S3TL by the company, was indeed present on die, dubious driver quality and possible issues at the hardware level as well, resulted in this engine being completely disabled at the driver level due to the prevalent graphical glitches it produced. By this point, the Savage 2000's one saving grace was effectively unusable. Worst yet, in almost all games not called Quake, the chip consistently sat at or near the bottom of performance charts, cementing S3's fall from the top of the pack to a budget tier has-been. As for the rest of the competition, the early 2000's were a bloodbath for the 3D graphics market. Though a number of graphics vendors silently slipped away, two industry giants collapsed in crushing defeat. 3DFX, who filed for bankruptcy and were subsequently acquired by Nvidia, and S3 Graphics, whose fall from grace was capped by an acquisition by none other than Via Technologies shortly after the S3 Diamond merger. S3 had officially given up on graphics, at least under its own strength. The remnants of S3, which now consisted largely of Diamond Multimedia's businesses, rebranded itself to Sonic Blue before dying a hardly noticed death in 2003. As for S3's graphics team, a sale to Via Technologies set into motion its final era, Zombification. At the time of writing this script in 2023, hindsight tells that if a company is sold to Via, then it is sold to die, whether it is Via a swift axing like Cyrix, or a slow, meandering death before its final light is snuffed out with little more than a newsletter or two to show for it, much like Centaur technology. In the case of S3 Graphics, its death was very much the latter, and also like Centaur, it is questionable whether or not it truly died in the first place. Moving into the early 2000s now, Via was still very much active as a chipset manufacturer for both Intel and AMD. Within these chipsets were integrated graphics cores based on the combination of the Savage 4 and the Savage 2000. There were, however, plans for a return to the discrete graphics market, with the ill-fated Savage XP, later renamed Alpha Chrome, having been announced and subsequently scrapped. Instead, development efforts turned to its successor, the Delta Chrome. The Delta Chrome truly could have been the mark of a revival for S3 graphics. Performance figures show that the card was a respectable low to mid-range performer, as had come to be expected from S3, and even outperformed similarly marketed offerings from Nvidia and ATI's low end. Its own successor, the Gamma Chrome, would move one step further, placing itself comfortably between the mid-range offerings of Nvidia and ATI in artificial tests. However, in benchmarks and games, it once again tended to fall to the bottom of the pack. As usual, drivers remained a prevalent issue throughout these two early releases of the Chrome series. It is important to note that VIA had, from its acquisition of Centaur technology, positioned itself as efficiency first by practically all means necessary, sacrificing performance in a race to the bottom in heat output and power consumption. This is what Gamma Chrome's successor, the Chrome S20 series, would seemingly focus on. 
S3, now as an extension of VIA, had all but given up on high-end performance and largely struggled with keeping up even in the mid-range. Instead, their cards were now pushed as multimedia solutions, placing heavy emphasis on their Chrome Motion video engine and the low wattage of the card as selling points for home multimedia use. Despite this, S3 strangely implemented their own answer to NVIDIA's SLI and ATI's Crossfire in the S20 series, dubbing their multi-GPU solution Multichrome. Given the already low performance of the cards, I personally wonder what they intended to do with such a multi-GPU setup. At best, it may have been possible for a pair of S27 cards to reach similar performances of mid-range NVIDIA or ATI offering, but at that point, especially given the continued issue of driver quality, it would have been far better to avoid S3 entirely. Finally, we arrive at S3's last gasp, the Chrome 400 and 500 series. Though officially two separate generations, the 400 and 500 were so similar at the hardware level, and released so close to each other that they were effectively the same thing. This final generation of discrete cards was S3's attempt to modernize, adopting a fully programmable unified shader architecture with GPGPU support, much like NVIDIA's CUDA cores. I know of precisely one program that utilized these cores for compute, and it was S3's own so-called PhotoPro demo reel, which automatically enhanced and or downscaled images. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you've ever come across any other program that uses S3 shader cores for compute. Regarding performance, the Chrome 400 and 500 series both came in two variants, the 30GT and 40GTX. Yes, they used NVIDIA's naming scheme. Both the 430GT and 440GTX, as well as their 500 series counterparts, were low-end offerings, and in fact, for their respective quote-unquote generations, the same physical die appears to even be used across both the 30 and 40, suggesting that the lower end 30 GT cards were just lower binned offerings. However, oh boy, however, there is, was, another. The Chrome 460 GTX, the final mid-range S3 card that never released. Information on the Chrome 460 is intensely spotty due to its cancelled release, so as a full disclaimer, my sources for this segment of the video and onward are dubious at best and rely mostly on old forum posts and minor announcements, alongside what little I have learned from my own growing collection of Chrome 460 dies. Strangely, the Chrome 460, supposedly codenamed Excalibur, I think, was to be produced on an older 90 nanometer process as opposed to the 65 nanometer that the Chrome 430 and 440 were produced on. Furthermore, it reportedly only supported up to DirectX 10 rather than DX 10.1 on its counterparts. I can only speculate why, but I will note that between die revisions, S3 switched manufacturers from Fujitsu to TSMC, marked by the shift from a gray sheen on the dies to a blue one as well as a reduction in size on the actual BGA package itself. If I were to guess a potential reason for the abrupt cancellation, which happened so close to release that there exists a beta driver claiming support for the 460, then I would say that, much like VIA axing Cyrix after acquiring them, heat output may have been an issue. Though VIA itself is strangely obsessed with efficiency at all costs, as mentioned before, the Chrome 460, for what little time it worked under my ownership, had a tendency to run intensely hot, even with S3's own stock cooler installed. Given how I have been communicating back and forth now for months about the card's repair and what dies may or may not still be functional, it is very much possible that the Chrome 460 was cancelled not only because it ran hot, but because it ran too hot, to the point of self-destruction, or something like that. Another speculated reason is that the Chrome 460 perhaps had too large of a die size to have reasonable yields, though that once again raises the question of why it was produced on a 90 nanometer node rather than 65 nanometer like its counterparts. I still hope that someday it'll work again. Anyway, with the release of the Chrome 400 and 500 series alongside their variants, S3 once again vanished from the discrete graphics space. Officially, the successor to this line of cards, the Chrome 600 series, is relegated to integrated graphics only, though it brought with it DX11 compatibility. 
Via would continue to recycle the 600 series into the Chrome 860, present in processors made by Via's Xiaoxin joint venture. And speaking of which, in 2011, three years after this final generation, S3 would be sold one last time to HTC, where it remains today. Because nothing physical appears to have ever come from this acquisition, it is likely that HTC bought S3 from Via purely for S3's large patent portfolio. Even then, because the aforementioned Chrome 860 is derived from the Chrome 640-645, it is likely that HTC licensed S3's technology back to Via. In fact, the page for Via's VX11 chipset, dated as being from 2016 at the oldest, replaces all mention of S3's branding with Via's. Thus, the Chrome 640 and 645 are no longer the S3 Chrome, but instead the Via Chrome. Last but not least, but certainly by far the most uncertain, is a discrete GPU made by Glenfly Technology, which is, and make sure you pay attention, a subsidiary of Zhaoxin, which is a joint venture between the Shanghai Municipal Government, the majority owner, and Via Technologies, which in turn is likely licensing S3's IP from HTC, which bought S3 largely for its patent portfolio from Via, which in turn spun off S3 as its own joint venture after having bought S3 from Sonic Blue, which was formed after a fateful merger between S3 and Diamond Multimedia. Returning to the GPU itself now, after that brief ramble, the Glenfly Arise-GT10CO appears to be a budget part that remains limited to DX11, though it supports OpenGL 4.5 as well. Beyond basic specs and performance figures on Glenfly's website, however, very little information appears to exist about this card, which does not even have a shader count published officially. Speculating further, Though Glenfly states that the Rise is the first independently developed display chip that they've produced, it is likely that, through its connection to HTC through Xiaoxin and Via, the Rise likely has some amount of S3 technology that lingers somewhere within. And for now, this is where the story of S3 graphics comes to a close. From the leader of the pack in 2D graphics to a questionably alive husk of its former self, packaged into a card that seemingly paper launched in 2021. Though it's certainly not the most glamorous fate of a former graphics giant, it is by far the strangest. Thank you for suffering through this video with me.